alone. Yes. Hi yes. everyone, I'm going to get started, um, and I'm sure people will be trickling in with this weather and traffic, but thank you for coming, for those of you who are here. Um, my name is Ng, I am the owner and the founder of Praise Shadows Art Gallery, and I look forward to having all of you at the gallery right after this. We'll just walk together, it's across the street if you haven't been, um, but you can just follow us as well if you, if you don't know where you're going. And we're just thrilled to have the show opening. Um, Crystal has shown with us before, and she you know, started out as a visitor to the gallery, and over time I just wondered, who is this person? Let's do a studio visit. Um, and in the two, almost three years of the gallery um, having been founded, I'm just so happy and honored to be showing Crystal and to have this show here. Um, I'm gonna do a very brief intro of the two ladies here, and then I'll send it over to Jess, and we'll end at five and just walk over. So, um, Crystal, bio, I think most of you know Crystal. <laughs> um, this is funny, I'm like reading the bio to her dad. <laughs> do you wanna tell us about Crystal? <laughs> um, Don't. <laughs> Crystal Lecouture is an artist based in Boston and North Adams, Massachusetts. She received her BFA in painting, printmaking from Skidmore College, where she received the Pamela Weidemann Award for Excellence in Printmaking. She has been a resident key holder artist at the Lower East Side Print Shop and has attended residencies at the Fine Arts Work Center, Surf Boy Foundation, Vermont Studio Center, the Vanguard Mastheads, Contemporary Artist Center, and Room 83 Spring. In addition to her full-time studio practice, Crystal is a curator at Tourists, a hotel near Mass Mocha in North Adams. She was recently profiled in Boston Art Review by <laughs> Jess Shearer <laughs> and interviewed on the podcasts I Like Your Work and Artist Mother Podcasts. Podcast, sorry. She exhibits her work throughout New England and New York and is represented by Prey Shadows. Um, I'm really also excited to share that we'll be bringing Crystal to the Dallas Art Fair for a solo booth in April, and um, I'm just thrilled to bring her beyond New England, potentially. <laughs> I think it's, it's definitely about time. Jessica Shearer, uh, Boston-based artist, or, sorry, art writer and critic, um, interested in explorations of gender, dislocation, and narrative. She's a senior editor at Boston Art Review and contributes to various magazines and collections. Her research focuses on art that engages with lived or inherited trauma with an emphasis on how that practice relates, whether by material, execution, concept, or all of the above to ancient methods of, stor of storytelling and meaning making. So thank you, Jess, for doing this for us. And over to you. Yay, thanks. Thank you. kick us off with another um, I, with a thank you from probably I'm gonna speak for both of us here um, thank you. I would like to thank Ng and praise shadows the talk that you're gonna hear today and the show that you're gonna go see is it has a level of warmth and vulnerability that I think is only really possible because of the space that Ng and the team have created in the environment that that is always prevalent at Pre Shadows. So thank you, Ng and Jaina and Matilda and Shemayam and Pima and Devin who carried stuff. <laughs> we love that as well. Um, so if you'll indulge me for a minute, you do all know Crystal or a lot of you know Crystal um, and you just heard her bio, but I do want to just reiterate a few things because um, what I find really remarkable about this show um, and your work in general is just how many disciplines it crosses, right? So Crystal is um, Crystal is a painter, she is a printmaker, she is a, a soundscape installation imagineer, um, and then of course she's a daughter, and she's a wife, and she's a mom, she's a friend, and um, for me personally, um, she's a beloved fellow nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, when Crystal and I um, first met, we bonded over just some really nerdy stuff. And actually, the first time we did anything together, we were walking a labyrinth, right? Oh, yes. 
um, and Crystal's work, and you'll see her work over there. We very specifically didn't want to show anything on a screen because you really have to be in front of Crystal's work for it to operate the way it is meant to operate. And I really wanted you to see that in that way first, if at all possible. Um, but it it draws from a few of, I know you have more, but a few of your guiding stars are um, ancient visual languages, so medieval illumination, um, spiritual abstractions. So for example, um, welcome. No, don't be sorry, welcome. Um, theosophic, theosophic, now I can't say the word. Um, philosophical <laughs> abstractions like Hilma F. Clint and Anna Cassell, and then outsider art. You love Bill Trailer, for example. Um, and I think what all of these disciplines share, and what's really evident in your work, is a sort of urgency of communication, a really potent, a really vital, something you really need to say and communicate. Um, and I think that what you'll find when you go over there is um, that what you what you see and what you do, um, what is so remarkable about your work is that you take what in 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 each of us in yourself and in each of us and in our lives what is hazy or small or broken or hard, and you set it blazing. <laughs> um, set it blazing and you glorify it. So this is my first question. Were you always like this? Was was this was this ability that you have to take something that is little and exalt it? Is that the way you've always been or is that something that you have tried to cultivate consciously? Well first of all let me say thank you. Thank you Jess. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here despite the rain. I'm so honored to be part of this show gallery, this friendship, this talk, and with all of you in the community, so it means a lot. Um, yes, let's see. Um, my sister's here, my dad's here. Um, yeah, I, I think that I have all, I probably had some OCD and some magical thinking and an obsession with saints and an obsession with cleaning rooms and making spaces. We moved around a lot as children and I was always recreating a space, my space. Um, I think also I, and I have been thinking about this a lot in my work, I became an artist because I love making things for other people. So I would make drawings or sewing kits or things out of fabric or things out of little stuffed animals, anything, because I loved somebody and I, I felt like that was my language for sharing and, and bestowing something that I could, that only I could make for them. Um, so I do think about I do think about that. I think about um, exalting the, you know, the regular everyday, and I think that's also why I'm very attracted to outsider art. And I think we've also talked about Romanesque and Gothic. Like I love things that are not um, perfectly technically made. I love things that are coarse and um, and uh, a little bit immediate. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the materials I choose to, uh, or I'm drawn to, are like woodcut and um, painting, but painting without tape or without like lots of drawing. Like I'm interested in like direct responses um, yeah. to the making and producing of the thing. Does that an answer? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And let's let's talk about how that plays out in this show. Yeah. So this show, when you come over with us all together. Um, than an hour, um, you're gonna see, I think, six large paintings, six or seven large paintings, eight even larger prints. You're going to see one really large, beautiful piece, of actually 21 <laughs> of your mama drawings. You're going to see a book. You're going to see um, th these incredible um, installation, sound installations that you can interact with. And you made all of that work this year. So, here's a question. How you doing? How's, <laughs> how <are> you okay? <laughs> How's your year been? Yes. Uh, great. And you know what? I, I think one of the working titles for the show was Repetition is Love. Mm. And I think 
often about how I'm, I'm drawn to obsessive work by, made by others. I feel like I get my point across by making things um, in repetition or in patterns or devotionally or you know over days. Mm -hmm. Everything feels very like I, I'm very drawn to sequential yeah. systems of of mark making of you know practices of um, sort of proving how much work I'll put in because I want this thing to be a really powerful offering yeah. of the most or you know get in the the corners and, and keep going with all the little um, marks because it doesn't feel done to me if it's just quick yeah it feels like I have to express the labor um, visually but also just for how I think about making the work right I solve a lot of the problems by doing things repeatedly so let's let's actually dive into one of your series one of the types of work that you'll see and talk about how you do that a little more specifically so um, I think a lot of us have come to know you through your mama drawings which we'll come back to later but your first love is painting um, and I'm, I was really I personally your paintings are everything to me um, and when you stand in front of them I think they're a really great example of what we were talking about earlier and what you were mentioning there is a vibratory relationship um, the sort of convocation or communication that happens between the audience member and the work. And so can you talk a little bit more about what you were trying to achieve with the painting? And then maybe if you can share, if you feel comfortable sharing, um, how you go about that when you're actually making the piece. Mm -hmm. um, I love painting. I, it's like will always be a thing that is, that is happening. Um, I love color mm -hmm. and I think um, at the outset of creating any sort of composition, there's a drawing um, in which I try to make things really tense. Um, maybe breaking up like into a grid and then adding um, symbols. Yeah. Um, I also like that maybe the, the, the imagery that appears in my work is like really simplistic. Like it's just circles and lines and triangles. And how can I activate those pieces to make something new every time? Mm. And I, I think I love color. That's probably my number one reason I make anything. Um, and so I, I think a lot about the palette right off the bat, about how I can make it strange, but beautiful, have close colors, like 10 different blues. Um, I want it to be, again, like sort of like an offering. Like I'm gonna give you the best color. I'm gonna give you this this weird space that's in and out and deep and, um, deep and frontal and at the same time, and you're never quite settled on what it is. Um, so I want things to be kind of weird, but I want them to also be exciting and new yeah. feeling. Yeah. Um, and I like to paint things like that. I like to use the same size canvas for multiple works so that you can kind of, they're all different. They're all of a sequence, but you can look between them and see the difference. Right, and see how those triangles or those squares yeah. or those lines can And alter. I love abstraction. I mean, I yeah. love talking about Klimt and, and um, Klimt and Anna Cassell, as we said, and I Sophie Tober uh, Arp. I mean, all these, all these like early twentieth century or, or like last set, this century before, women who were like just, def, you know, making new abstraction, and yeah. because they felt this, like, I, I guess I'm mostly driven or drawn to artists that are making work because they feel they must. Yeah. And that's the love of outsider artists. That's the art. Of, that's the love of religious art. Right. Um, and to your point, like yeah. they have communicated. Right, yeah. they're giving a message. Yeah. Your works hold messages. Mm -hmm. um, so this brings me to, and you and I talk about this a lot. So um, I think, and uh, any of you who know Crystal personally, um, I'm curious to know if this feels right to you. Um, I, the thing I love about you, you know, as a human, is that you're very strange in <laughs> a um, sort of a paradoxical way. So. Um, you are both, you, you feel incredibly intensely and immediately, like you can, you can see an emotion hit Crystal like as soon as, you know, um, and you're really porous that way, but you're also really pragmatic um, and it's, and, and you set a lot of rules for yourself, like if you go to Crystal's studio, she has a lot of rules about how things can be done, um, and I'm wondering, do you, 
create those parameters for yourself as a way of, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you in here more broadly. Why do you create those parameters for yourself? Because I need confining. I'm too excited by many, many ideas and I need to have like the material confine me, the, um, the intention confine me. <laughs> I'll be all over the place. I mean, you'll see in the show, like I have so many different mediums that yeah. I'm working with and I, I think I need to um, stay and explore, stay and explore, stay and explore. And then maybe the, um, the open-endedness happens over like the duration rather than, um, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I, does that kind of make sense? Right, because you'll see it's very cohesive, right? Because I like so to, we're, I'm, yeah. I'm somebody who like makes and the making helps me do the thinking. Yeah. And so like, especially with this book or with the prints or with those mama drawings, like doing something over years really helps me figure out what it does and why it does it. Right. And why I keep, keep doing it. And we've talked about this a little bit. You have a reciprocal way of going about your work, right? You create offering. Mm -hmm. And then you... For myself as well. Right. It's doing something for me. Yeah. And then you notice how people respond. And that response goes back into the work. And it just sort of rolls forward and forward and forward and on and on. Um, and you mentioned this earlier, but I'd love for you to talk a little more about it. Because this is something that when you go and look closely at the work, you'll be able to see. And it's really delightful. Um, you don't use the like the second hand. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll notice when you're over there, it looks very symmetrical, right? Mm -hmm. but, it, but this is not. And it's very intentional that you subvert that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to the authenticity of, of like the devotional offering that <clears throat> I feel like there has to be less in between me and the making. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, not like crunch, but like for me, just that line, the tape line is like a mechanized line. I'd rather have wobbly hand line yeah because again I'm saying that there's a there's a human who made this imperfect thing for you or the world <laughs> <laughs> um, which brings us to the prints so be because you have a I, I think you have a pretty storied relationship with um, with printmaking and it is another example of how you do not make things easy on yourself <laughs> <laughs> right it could be you you could it could be easier you like it to be hard so can you um, walk us through what it takes to get from conception to a final print that you see on the walls like what walk us through that process well this is the third series that I've done something like a, a set of prints that is about time mm -hmm. the first one um, they were called time keepers the second were tools for measuring time. And this one is, they're all individual works, but it's really just one day. There are eight pieces that make um, different pieces of the day. Um, and I just, I start by making crazy colors and then seeing um, how I can intensify the color by adding another weird color. And I just do all these layers of like moving shapes around and mm -hmm. then it becomes something that I see something in and then I transform that further into some kind of symbolic narrative describing a day or a breakfast table or um, the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I have like sort of like these elements that I love to move around and that, that happens in all, all of my practices. Yeah. Um, and so it may start accidental and then I shape it um, working between multiple pages at once. And these are and wood I, blocks. These are wood blocks, which right. I began at the Fine Arts Work Center. Um, mostly as like the big flat that needed a press mm -hmm. and then the smaller pieces of the wood because I cut the wood into like I drew with my saw made all these different shapes and moved them around on the page and um, sort of shaped them into being a story right so um, once again your hands it's so empty. yeah and there's a lot of um, type in them I like to again you'll see like I have kind of this I like to the obsessive mark to sort of amplify or, or make auras around circles. Um, so I, using kind of like unexpected letters, like all around the sun, like mm -hmm. Z's or yep. B's or X's in corners. Like, I just like that you see it as something and then you notice that it has, it has something else to do, you know, it's, it, it's text or. Right, um, that codifies yeah. visual language. Yeah. Right, it's message right. making, it's meaning making. Um, meaning making, so. Um, 
that brings us to, I think, the series that maybe we, I, knew um, Crystal for, um, I'm wearing it, <laughs> um, originally, and which is an incredibly powerful series. I think it's really, um, a lot of folks really have, have had very close experiences with, which is your mom, which are your mom's run. Um, can you tell us first how they, how this series came to be, and then we'll talk about this piece specifically. Sure. Um, so, in the pandemic, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer, which was very tragic. Um, she was young and very healthy, so it seemed out of the blue. And because of the pandemic, I could never, we could not be with her um, at Texas Generous. And it made, though she lived really close by, it made this like so many layers of bar barriers, like, you know, the, the virus, her illness. Um, and so I felt very like, impotent, like an, in, unable to be helpful in her time of need or to be close or to have touch. And so I think I was, at COVID made everything weird and people were trying, you know, we were all trying new ways of making art or not making art and just being very challenged in, in what we were used to doing. And so I found at this a sporting goods store these paper targets and they had this like amazing, strong graphic um, circles all over it. And I was immediately drawn to it. They're really inexpensive. They were like 12, 12 and a pack for $5 or something. So I bought many, many packs of them. And I thought, let me just play, let me do something. So I made first a bunch of moon calendars. I made these kind of weird things that were about the amorphous time of COVID. And then I started dressing these other ones. And because of her, and we would be on the phone, and I would be, rather than making large paintings in this like very physical, labor-intensive way, I just was instead sitting at a desk and who knew what the future was of any of us doing anything or you know, getting out of the virus. And so I just thought, God, this is such powerful material. I need to, maybe I can do something. Like you get a little bit like magical in your, your thinking. And so I thought, um, maybe I, this, I can harness this power, redirect it to her, make this thing that's like masculine and violent and about speed and disposable and offer it instead as like a tribute, a totem, um, something like a mandala and offered as a healing um, drawing for her. And so I made many of these and they just made me feel good. And I used these colors that were both soft, like a body, like light pinks, um, and also warning colors that were like cautionary yellow and um, red. And I just like, I sort of made this weird system um, and it made me feel good. And because they were small and inexpensive, I could just make many. And then seeing them together or giving them away or showing her, um, it just made me feel like I was doing something. And then I started thinking, oh my God, maybe if you if you imagine like healing, yeah. like it's it's getting put in there. It's like three hours of me making this drawing and it's also like, you know, imbued with my strength, intention, love. Um, so, I mean, it's a crazy, crazy idea. No, but I think, I think, I think that translates. Yeah. I think you're gonna stand in front of them and it's gonna translate and I know it did for me. I mean, yeah. and I added the word mama in there. Right just sort of as like my, I like these things where it's, it means something to me. One doesn't need to know in the audience, but to me it, it meant like an extra little um, PowerPoint, a key or, or something, an Easter egg. And so I put the word mama in, her name was um, Marlene Adelman. Yeah. So that stood for her, but then it also stood for me as a mama. Um, and then I was thinking about the word mama and across many languages, it's like a universal word. Yeah. Um, and there's some kind of, uh, it's, you know, what do you, what do you say when you need help? And so, I, I don't know, I just thought that was something. A call. Yeah, and so it just made it part of the system too. It's like they were finished by adding the chalk or the signature. You rule, yeah. you got a rule. I had a rule. <laughs> <laughs> that was your parameter. Yeah. Um, so, ne so then, your mother came second. And, um, but the series has continued. Yes. And you will see, again, you're going to see 21 and 8 in one beautiful frame and the focus of your love and your attention has altered so can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that? So this piece that you'll see a large framed grouping of all of these drawings um, is called Half Mass 21 B Baldy and um, after two years of working with this material I did feel like it was time to address what it, it, it you know what, what the material is um, and so 
our school shootings are horrible. They make me fall to my knees when I hear that children have been shot. And um, that event in Uvalde, Texas, really hit me on a day where the children were 11, my twin sons were 11. Um, they were all mostly children of immigrants who come for like a safer you know, life and a better education. And it just, that was just so senseless. And so um, it's one that I've just thought about over and over again. And so I have realized that like making a collection of these drawings amplifies their power, at least to me visually, yeah. um, to the eye. And so I have been thinking about how I can address the material, address this terrible, you know, can you know, pandemic of violence we have, epidemic of violence. Um, and I took a big swing and uh, <laughs> made them together. And I hoped it would read to people that the drawings were standing in for each of the victims, um, without other um, notations about the names or. It, it, it's just enough to just be grouped together. You feel like the, the, the horror of so many at once. Yeah, but also the brightness, the, the exactly. sweetness, right? Yeah. The yeah. sweetness that each of these lives. Right. Well, I, I think it's safe to say that it was effective. Um, I am allowed to say that an institution has a fire. That's all I am. Okay. <laughs> um, but an institution has a fire. Um, in keeping with these tributes, um, specifically those that kind of um, came out of your grief for your mother, um, you have you made a book. Um, you made a book, and um, it is available across the street. I don't. We're not going to go like super in depth on the Q and A on this because Crystal is going to have another talk with Kristen Parker and. Um, at the Boston Art Book Fair, Boston Art, Art Book Fair. Art Fair, yes. That's November 11th. Yeah, so I encourage you guys all to come to that as well. But um, it, the, the story behind the making of this book, and I do just want to say, again, plug, this is a plug, but um, I love Prey Shadows, as you probably know. One of my favorite things about Prey's um, is that they, and Crystal too, actually, is that they um, work really, really hard to make sure that anybody at any price point can have a bit of art. Um, and so this is something that, you know, if you can't afford one of Crystal's pieces, um, you can still get this. And it's still something that you can have. And it's still, a piece, it is very much a piece of art in its own right. So um, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. what this is? So this book is called 11 Months. and. Um, in Judaism, our family is Jewish. In Judaism, there is a the morning practice. Um, one says the, the morning, the mourner's kaddish, which is like the the morning prayer every day for eleven months um, when a, a parent dies. It's less for a spouse or a child, and that finding that out spoke to me because it it, it sort of uh, emphasized like the the primary relationship between like who you came from, basically, yeah. um, and, the, and the child as a mourner. And so um, I don't know how to grieve. You know, I, this was new to me. Um, where I just felt like I needed to do something, but I didn't want to make like a monument or um, something, you know, like a, a headstone, like that, that didn't feel right to me. It felt like um, I needed to do something that would make me feel better, but also acknowledge loss and so um, at my daughter's bat mitzvah we were getting our nails done she and I and I had the the person the, the nail technician add a little heart to my thumb because I felt like we were doing the celebration but it was only two weeks before and so we were in grief and it was just the world's colliding and I needed to have like some kind of little badge of, of memory of, of where we were and so I just kept it, after a couple weeks when the heart was Know, falling off it's like I kept doing it for 11 months just so I had this little um, notice to myself that she was missing and that I was thinking of her and during this time I just kept photographing my hand out in the world touching something usually the most 
earthy, most sensual, most delicious, most full of life thing. Um, and so it was just sort of like a way to, to pass the 11 months. And then I, I, you know, as I was doing these walks and I was thinking about all the layers of, of missing her and, and experiencing the world for her, um, I sort of clued into it being a portable practice, a self-portrait because the phone was just in my pocket, yeah. one hand taking out the other hand. Um, I intentionally made it faceless and so it was just basically hands so that one another mourner could insert themselves into the pages of this book and imagine them doing the same kind of practice. So I liked all those, those symbolic layers and again it just made me feel close to her yeah. and because she was um, well-known herbalist and she worked in the space where there was all this touching and collecting and cooking and food and, and we grew up in a household of like hospitality and my parents were caterers for a while and there was just sort of this like you know using your hands kind yeah. of um, creative world and part of her business and like the branding is that they were always photographing her hands touching things so I was just kind of you know using her language to do this in the practice and then when it was done, it was done. And I look back at all the photographs. And again, they sort of exist on one level because there are um, you know, all these little secrets in it that I would know from my life, like a, my child's shoe or my dog or um, we're somewhere on a trip. But um, to anyone else, they're just sort of the hand um, out there in the world, <laughs> experiencing the world for somebody who's no longer in it. Um, and then I also, because she was an herbalist, I did, um, I collected all the botanical species that we touch, I touch in the photograph. You were moved by nerds. Yeah, and <laughs> so I just thought, and what it remains interesting to me about this book is that, you know, any life is huge, and in Judaism, one would say, like, um, the whole world can die with when someone dies, because they're, they're whole, they have their own world, their own right, universe, have experienced right. their own universe. Um, and so I just felt, for a life important to me, it was just worthy of making a full memorial. And so printing this book realized that this was the memorial. And a different kind of non-stationary memorial, but like something you could just, again, portable to take it with you. But because you're you. Because I'm me. Because you're you, you gave it all to us, right? Yeah. Because you could, this could be a private album. Yeah. Right? But the, yeah. that's not how you do it. Right. You have to share. You have to share I'll one. I'll read, I'll read the one yeah, thing. I, I have this. Say, so I'd love for you to I share. I felt very fancy because I contacted the University of uh, Texas at Austin and got permission to use this quote from Borges yes, from this that is fancy. wonderful um, little short writing um, called The Witness. And I have it in the front. And this sort of encapsulates like the, the reason and um, the meaning behind this project. Um, but something or an infinite number of things dies in every death, unless the universe is possessed of a memory, as the theosophists have supposed. In the course of time, there was a day that closed the last eyes to see Christ. The battle of Junin and the love of Helen each died with the death of some man. What will die with me when I die? What pitiful or perishable form will the world lose? So I love too that in that the last person who would have known mother when they died was like this like that I don't know there's, there's layers <laughs> but um we all contain a universe in multitudes yeah. right that's beautiful thank you I just want to sit with that for a second that's really beautiful um and it's again what I think is so wonderful about your work is you take the things that are hard and you make them beautiful right and you make them joyful and I think um, you really see that in this last um, this last series that um, we really do if there's when you go over touch the bells <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you are allowed don't touch the paintings but touch the bells um, and um, you've made an incredible series um, which we'll talk about kind of how that operates in a second but first can you tell us where why bells why bells well I started doing or being interested in bells because my mother back to my mother um, she gave me a shopkeeper's uh, bell to put on my studio door yeah 
and I just, um, she wasn't incredibly effusive or said that she was proud of me often, maybe ever. Um, <laughs> but she gave me this little noisemaker to put on my door, which to me symbolized like a room of my own that when the bell rang, somebody was interrupting my creative space, my work. Um, so it just made me feel like I'm in business, you know, like with my little bell on the door. And I just thought that was such a beautiful um, way to change the space from being just the sound of a bell to change it from being a private space to an open space. Like yeah. you're, you're notified every time somebody comes in. Um, and so I started collecting bells and then collecting a lot of bells. Yeah. And then as meanwhile, I had also been doing something with large wooden beads, which I had found at this great Vermont store in Dorset where my sister has a house in Manchester. And um, they were just so sumptuous and earthy and had cool colors. And I just started, um, I, again, in COVID, like time was strange. So I felt like marking time by with evidence yeah. was like a beautiful thing. So I was making all these strands of beads and then I was adding the bells. And then I thought, oh, this is like, the scale is strange everyone needs help <laughs> um, so I started thinking about how we bless the house one could bless the house with like an oversized necklace that not only does a body wear jewelry but perhaps a space to, to wear jewelry and so I've been making these strands of varying length um, called house jewelry I have one yeah. <laughs> and I'll finish them with like a, a necklace clasp I mean it's large but um, there's something about it that feels very touchable. They're very touchable and it does feel almost like a gong, right? Mm -hmm. Like a beginning mm -hmm. or, or, an, or, an, or an entrance or summoning. And I will say, I don't have a door um, on my office, but I have it hanging on a hook near the doorway and my husband does have to hit it if he's coming into my room. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yeah, I will literally, he will come walk up to me and I will just stare at him. I won't answer any questions until he goes to <laughs> um, So. Get a bell and the time, the start of a new time. Yeah. Um, but um, so we are going to. Um, I want to but right before oh, we. Oh, wait, wait. I'm going to talk yeah. about the other piece too. Yeah, yeah. So of course I have to kind of keep making more more things in the thing. Yeah. Um, so now I've been adding coded messages inside the strands of the beads yeah. and the bells. Um, and I found a really beautiful binary code um, made in the 1870s by a Frenchman named Emile Baudot. And it was the first five bit code where um, each letter is described with ones and zeros. And so I thought, this is so cool because I want only, I want these strands and these necklaces, this house jewelry to be mm -hmm. like a protective adornment for whatever space they're in. But I also thought, let me intensify the power by adding a message and so I um, use I spell a message with the ones being the bells and the beads being the zeros and so many of the strands say bless this house or protect this home or safe haven mm -hmm. and there's a piece that you'll run your hands over called epistle which says bless this house on one side and inside and out and given the state of the world, it's just sort of nice to think that we're all, you know, Hail Mary, we'll, we'll bless the house with some <laughs> crazy artist jewelry, but um, <laughs> maybe it does something. So it's, I'm, I'm taking that um, further. It's very interesting. Codified messages? Codified messages, yes. I love it. I have one more question, and then so I'm going to give you guys a heads up. We've got one more question. We have about 10, 15 minutes then for, yep about 10 minutes for your question. So get ready. I will just call on you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, get ready. Um, but speaking about language, language is obviously important to you regardless of whether or not it is something we can read or it's kind of just hidden. So tell me about the title of the show. Evening in the Evening. Why? Oh, I knew that I was doing it. Um, so I was telling love poetry. I listen to poetry. Um, again, I have like this, I, I love to do multiple things at a time. I'm not very good at um, being uh, like multitasking, but I love listening.
listening to books and poetry and uh, while I'm making work. It feels like it's so fruitful, like it really ignites my brain. And so I heard this poem by a Native American poet named Jake Skeets. And he's basically kind of doing what I was doing in this practice by exploring the world and talking about his garden and looking at all the little stuff. And he's using his Diné language to um, describe all the things he's seeing, like the clouds and the flowers. And he ends it by saying something about how the clouds shrug their shoulders in the orange sky and, uh, and it is evening's evening. That's the last line. And again, as somebody who's very interested in time and marking time, I just really like that there was a smaller version of noticing time within the time. The already, you know, <laughs> the already micro moment of yeah. the evening. But There's I think even all, like an evening of the year. And I think we all can, we all know what yeah. the key yeah. means by that. So the, we it's the beginning of the beginning of the evening. Yeah. Or the evening of it. <laughs> the evening yeah. of it. The evening of the evening. Um, so I want to, I want to, yeah. who has questions? Oh, good. Oh, great. Well, it's, I don't know if it's more of a question or more of a comment, but very early in the talk, you said something that struck me as very curious, and I think you've answered it now through the rest of the talk, but you said that you love making things for other people, yeah. and I always think of artists as being, and makers as being very selfish, working in your studio, and in fact, it made me think back to the first time I met you, which was at the closing of your other show, your previous show, and you had set up in the gallery, and you were painting, you were making your mama drawings, and yeah which I thought was amazing, because I don't think I personally could ever do that, but you were sharing how you make them, and you were actually painting them in the gallery. And so I'm just curious, if when you're in the studio, do you ever think about yourself as well when you're working? Oh, yeah. Well, it makes me feel good to be generous. And I, I mean, we didn't talk about my mail art projects, but I also <laughs> love blasting the world with many <laughs> objects of ephemera and mail art. And I'm very interested in the idea of helping, of being a helper. And, ha and setting things out into the world to do something for others. I did that um, piece, I did this mail art project years ago, Welcome Future, in COVID. And it was basically a little Leno cut um, that said Welcome Future. It was a, a set of matches that said Welcome Future. And then there was like an, a, a form letter that was addressing um, 2020 and how it was like the worst year ever <laughs> and how it's taken so much from us and we hate it and you were going to write your grievances and then you were going to fold it and put it in the envelope that said farewell 2020 and then you lit it on fire <laughs> in a ritual at new year's and i think many of you received that um, but i just get these kind of crazy ideas and then i follow them all the way and it makes me feel good that and i run into this all the time people have these little welcome future prints on their walls like in a gallery or in their home or they framed it and uh, it gives them something. Yeah. And um, I love that. I love the legacy of just the art is out there and it's, um, it exists in somebody's world. And then what did you do with that? <coughs> you turned it into a book. Oh, and then I made, <laughs> and then I made these string light things in my backyard that because I was imagining that like the aliens or the <laughs> airplanes would, would, someone would be like really having a bad day and they would look outside and they would say, welcome future. <laughs> and uh, it was like a broadcast to them. And then when the election happened and Biden won, I did another one that said, shoot, I can't remember what it said. <laughs> Scott, that's terrible. <laughs> so uh, new day, it said oh, new day. So I was out there with, you know, 200 strands of white light in the snow making new day and then running up to my third floor of my house and photographing it and being like, oh, I love that. <laughs> I didn't even really go anywhere, but like I, I'm really a motor for making crazy systematic like Not projects. Crazy. Yeah. And, and then I did a lullaby mail art. I mean, don't worry, there will be a mail art coming at some point. <laughs> yes, everybody, so everybody get on the mail list. Please give me your address. <laughs> well, and also I've, I have give, done a, an addition to Christmas holiday card for 20 years. So there are people, and I love this idea, maybe my sister and my dad are, are people who have all of them. And so, you know, who, who knows? I probably don't even have all of them. But I just like, they're worth something. <laughs> I like to keep doing stuff, um, you know, trying again and again annually. <laughs> so, 
And there's a great history of artists making holiday cards. I have a book on it. It's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> we should get that for the show. Yeah. And does anyone else have a question? I can keep going, but I want to keep you guys. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that like constraints um, just seem to really like imposing on your work are very similar to rituals in that they both sort of like solidify what something is going to mean either in the process or even in the product. But like if you're doing a series as you have been, meaning must sometimes change or your sense of meaning must change as you're working. How do you, so how do you, I'm really interested, like create these rituals around making while also being able to accommodate like changes in you and work? I am there for the changes. I love that. I love when the work evolves and I I'm kind of keep doing it things over and over to see what happens um, and change how I feel about it and what it gives me and what it means as a whole. Um, and again, like all of these projects, like the layers add up as I keep doing it. Um, so okay. that that's the rewarding part for me too. Does the ritual give you a sense of safety to maybe Definitely. explore, right? Like yeah. if you know what your parameters are, you can stay yeah. kind of like within them, in that within the ritual, then you can mentally put that down. And I be think aware it also makes awesome it more powerful, yeah. right? Like it, it like um, distills it. Well, we've talked about this, but the word that comes up for me with you um, always is devotion, right? Mm -hmm. And what are devotionals, right? They are they are acts of love and compassion um, that are done in a specific way again and again and again and again. Um, I'm also devoted to the practice of making art and being an artist and having being so lucky to have this life making work. Um, so it's it fulfills me to just keep going. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> we all need it, all of us artists. We need you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we thank you so, so, so much. Um, we're all going to go across the street, right? Because you all want to have that like busy interaction, I'm sure. Um, so we'll see you over there and you can ask your questions to Crystal. Thank you.